Good morning. I hope you can all hear me clearly. Um, I'm Johnny Bell from the Northern Ireland Open Government Network, so uh, a very warm welcome to everyone, uh, wherever, wherever you're tuning in from. Uh, today's webinar is the second in a series being hosted by the Northern Ireland Open Government Network. Um, the series is part of our UK Pioneer Project, which is a, a collaborative project between the UK Open Government Networks. And the project really aims to build the capacity of citizens and civil society to use open approaches to progress the UN Sustainable Development Goals um, and to try and raise awareness and understanding of the UN Sustainable Development Goals and encourage citizens to play a more active role in encouraging their governments to progress the SDGs. Just a couple of housekeeping issues before we start. Um, I'd ask if you could all keep your microphones muted during the talk. And if you do have a question, can you please write your name in the comment box? And after the talk, we can call out your name. You can ask the question. Uh, we might not have time for all the questions uh, as we're online until around 12 o'clock. Uh, now, I'd like to introduce our speaker, uh, Dr. Graham Long, who's a senior lecturer in politics at Newcastle University. Uh, he's been researching the SDG since about 2013. Uh, and from sort of 2014, 2015, he's worked with uh, NGOs and academic involvement uh, in negotiations to try and agree the goals in both the UK and European context. One of his current projects uh, explores the implications of the SDGs for the UK, uh, mapping current UK data onto the SDG targets to generate a, a kind of picture of their applicability and relevance in a UK context. So uh, without anything further from me, I'll hand over to Graham. Great, thanks very much. Oh, uh, thanks for coming, everybody. Um, let's see, if you can't hear me okay, just please let me know. Um, so uh, I'll try and keep it fairly brief. Hopefully I won't speak for the whole 30 minutes. Um, if anyone's got any clarificatory questions, if you type them in chat, I'll try and get to them as we go along. Uh, and hopefully, I'll, I mean, please feel free to ask me anything you want to know about the SDGs or any aspect of the current process. Um, I don't know everything, uh, but I'll, I'll try and answer everything I can. So I thought um, I'd say something today in three sections. Um, so I've called the talk Progress and Priorities, Process and Participation. Uh, the first section will say something about this exercise of assessing what the goals mean for the UK, how relevant they are for the UK. The second section will give you some sense, maybe some of you will know this already, some of you maybe not, of where uh, the, the current, uh, what kind of current processes are in place in the UK, uh, regionally and globally around the SDGs. Uh, and the third section, which I guess will be the shortest, offers some reflections on kind of open government values, especially participation. Um, not so much running through where that features in the goals, but uh, highlighting the connection between some of the, uh, the forums and the narratives around the goals and, and open government values. Uh, so let me kick off. So, um, so one piece of work that I've done with some uh, kind of a small research team at Newcastle, uh, which I think uh, Parliament found quite helpful, was to assess what the goals might mean for the UK. Uh, and the first thing I wanted to say, sorry, I'm, I'm an academic, so this is uh, uh, how I do things, is to give you a, a, a so this reflect on the method. Um, so what does it mean to kind of say that the goals are applicable or relevant to the UK? Um, first thing I want to say is that you can make a distinction between being applicable and being relevant. Um, and you can also talk about the applicability of the targets or the indicators, that's to say that the, the metrics that the, the UN has agreed to, to measure these, measure progress towards the targets on, or you can talk about a combination of the two. Now, applicability of the SDGs to the UK is easy. I mean, this is a universal agenda, uh, and universal here is taken to mean that it applies to all countries. It's not quite as straightforward to that as that because some of the uh, some of the targets are especially focused on um, issues facing small island developing states, or uh, some of the means of implementation only make sense really for countries in special situations. Um, certainly, about 170 of the things that the UN wants to measure about progress towards the SDGs, uh, it makes sense to ask about them in the UK. Um, it makes sense in kind of the, 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 the widest sense. That's not to establish that they're policy relevant. So, for example, I think one of the indicators on infrastructure under Goal 9 is uh, whether there's uh, people have access to a paved road. And just for, for almost all people in the UK, that just isn't a, a pressing issue. I mean, it makes sense to ask it, but it's, it turns out the answer is yes. Um, maybe more importantly, there's a, a target for maternal mortality. 
um, uh, that the UK surpasses. And it kind of makes sense to, to apply that target to the UK, but fortunately, uh, by and large, the UK surpasses it, although the question might be if anyone is left behind, as I'll come to shortly. The relevance of the uh, uh, targets and their indicators to the UK is then a bit more uneven. Um, you can get relevance in a couple of ways. So the clearest kind of relevance, um, you know, that I guess is a, what I'd suggest from the work I've done, is the, is where you get a clear target ambition in the SDG document, just in the list of targets under each goals. Plus, you can get hold of data which is either on the SDG indicator or a near neighbor kind of indicator. So something that really allows you to speak to how far that target's been achieved or not. Um, you get more of this relevance in the UK than you might think because the SDGs have this commitment to leave no one behind. That's to say that you have to pay attention to inequality and to focus on the most disadvantaged. So even if the story on uh, the aggregate for the UK as a whole is positive, that needn't imply that everyone everywhere is, is having uh, whatever um, the SDG target requires uh, it's in place for everyone. And so um, close attention to dis disaggregated data can also help to make the case for relevance. And in these kinds of cases, you know, notice that accountability is an open government value. Um, the goals can just become an accountability resource. You know, I guess the question is always, given that the UK has signed up to these, um, if the UK has a policy or it has a, it's measuring something that isn't the same as the SDGs, and it seems like the SDG uh, target is, is, uh, is salient and seems kind of sensible, then then why wouldn't we adopt that target in the UK is, I think is a worthwhile question to ask. And certainly some parliamentary committees have asked that kind of question, use the SDGs in that kind of way. At the other end of the spectrum, you get cases where the SDG target is just not very well worded or it's unclear, or the indicator is just not right to measure the target, uh, only measures a part of the target, for example. But you can still see that there's there's an issue here that it's driving at, which is uh, important and worthwhile. And there, the SDGs can prompt deliberation, but I think they prompt accountability in the same kind of way, not quite as, as, as straightforwardly. So that's background. Um, overall, there's plenty of UK relevance, and it goes further than you might think. I'm not going to give you lots of statistics here, um, but I can do in, in questions if people want them. Um, I include some links at the end of the presentation. Obviously, we'll, we'll circulate the, the presentation around, and you can uh, follow those and track down some of the numbers. Um, I have 120 pages of data on all the targets and their indicators, and I don't intend to try and run through that. I guess the starting point is, to, is you might think that the relevance of these goals to the UK, given their sustainable and development goals, is focused on international development, so what the UK does overseas, and the environment within the UK. And there certainly is uh, relevance in those dimensions. I mean, the international development, something I'll leave aside for now, I can tackle in questions. Um, the environmental relevance is certainly there, so food waste, sustainable consumption, um, energy, uh, renewable energy, uh, fossil fuel subsidies. There are lots of ways in which uh, there's a kind of uh, climate change. So the, the, I guess the usual environmental sustainability agenda is all present, uh, but there are some other things too. So uh, I think what might surprise people uh, a bit is that the, the social agenda in the SDGs is very relevant once you factor in this idea of leaving no one behind. Now, there's a very clear target on poverty by national definitions and reducing that. Um, there's a clear target on food insecurity, and there's some reasonable data which could be improved on food insecurity in the UK, and it's higher than you might think. Um, there are targets on malnutrition, and the UK has both an obesity problem and also, especially in some sectors, I think especially amongst the elderly, um, quite an important undernourishment problem uh, that seems to come out in the data. Um, there are targets, very clear ambitions on health and mental health, and again, uh, you know, strong available data. There's um, uh, so where targets are phrased is either you know zero something, reducing something to zero, or else a proportional reduction, that makes their applicability to the UK much easier. So if you have to, if the target in the SDGs is reduce mortality from uh, non-communicable disease by one third, then I guess the question would be, and we could we know that that, that people die in the UK from non-communicable disease, and I guess the question would be why is the, you know, if that's not the ambition, then why uh, then why isn't it? What would be the appropriate ambition? Is a question this prompts. Um, so there's a zero target on violence against women and girls, I think it's quite potent. Um, clear targets on sexual and reproductive health and rights. Uh, targets on waste, sustainable agriculture. Water stress, I think, comes out, uh, and, and fresh water cleanliness uh, comes out. So there is a water agenda for the UK as well as a water agenda overseas. Um, 
decent housing, enough housing, um, uh, food waste, all these kinds of things. There are straightforward uh, targets plus indicators. Then there's some more difficult areas where there are clearly relevant issues, but the targets aren't themselves very precise. I don't necessarily blame the, the government's negotiating the goals for this. This was, was tricky and it was political. Um, all the indicators are imperfect, and again, it's very hard to track uh, some of these very complex targets through a single or just a couple of indicators. Um, and here, I think they can prompt some debate, but I don't think they get the, the they don't give you the answers. Um, so and what it means to value unpaid domestic and care work, for example, I think there's, a, there's an ambition there which is very applicable. I think how they try to measure that isn't ideal, uh, but it prompts the question of what should we do about this? Um, on inclusive growth, there's a relatively clear target, the idea that uh, the poorest should fare better than the rest in economic growth. Uh, on equality, uh, alcohol and substance abuse, uh, the transition to sustainable industry, um, these kinds of things, there are, clearly these are questions worth asking, although the SDGs themselves don't you know, generate the answers. Uh, everybody uh, tends to want to know from this what the priorities should be for the UK, um, but unfortunately, there's, it's not easy to generate priorities. Um, so I'm getting a message here from uh, Jetska Geming to so to make her the uh, or, or him the presenter. Is that uh, Connor? What should I do? Hi, uh, hi, Graham. I think she's actually left the conversation. Um, maybe if she comes back on, she can register that again, uh, and we can. If she has something to say. We can bring her into the conversation. Right. Okay. Uh, so turn on ahead. Right, thanks. Okay, so everybody would like to know what the priorities are, uh, but it's not easy to generate priorities. I mean, you have a, a lot of priorities, and if you have a lot of priorities, that really means you don't have many priorities at all. So it's not clear which of these things you would do first, or those kinds of issues. Nor does it tell you exactly how to go about resolving any of these things. Um, so the SDGs aren't a, a kind of a slam dunk uh, in those sorts of ways. Okay, so. If that's a summary of some of the work around um, current UK performance on the SDGs, and I can go into that in more detail, in particular areas as people want. Um, the second thing I want to say something about is the um, UK level processes. So um, some of you may be aware of this, some of you not. So before the election, uh, DFID, uh, who are leading on UK implementation of the goal, so the Department for International Development, um, and in conjunction with the, the Cabinet Office, but sometimes that uh, relationship is a bit fuzzy, um, offered um, a kind of a, a summary plan and review of UK implementation of the goals at home and abroad. Um, and that wasn't very good, I don't think, and I can you know tell people why in questions, and I have a uh, kind of an analysis of this that I linked to at the end. Uh, but it was a start, and it shows it can be done. Um, and also, the UK government committed to incorporate the SDGs and their indicators into the a refresh of single departmental plans. Um, and if that happens, that's, that could be very potent, because it gives you something to look at and see how far the SDGs have been incorporated, and it gives you a kind of a target to assess against the ambition in the SDGs. Now, I'm not clear where those policies currently stand, given the, the election. I guess we'll see what the Queen's speech says, amongst other things. Um, and also, what kind of priorities are there for government? I think obviously, that, there's, a, there's the potential that that gets uh, kicked into uh, the long grass. Um, we'll see what happens. Data-wise, the Office for National Statistics has been uh, kind of uh, accorded the, the responsibility to gather data on all UN indicators and report them to the UN. <laughs> Every year, uh, and there will be a consultation launched shortly. In uh, my understanding, is in July, um, but that consultation won't ask what they should gather. I guess the question it's probably going to ask is what uh, should they gather first, or which uh, target areas do they think um, are most important to try and disaggregate, and um, in what ways would they disaggregate? So it's going to ask. A, it's not going to ask all the big questions. I think. Um, the government chose to take some of the indicator work, they chose the indicators on which the government are going to report in-house uh, into the refreshed single departmental plans um, earlier this year. And that's quite an interesting move that, again, we can discuss. So in terms of review, uh, parliamentary scrutiny in the UK has been, I think, uh, good. Uh, you might even say world-leading. Um, so there have been three uh, parliamentary inquiries into the uh, SDGs. Um, I take it in the current political situation in the UK, uh, parliamentary committees will acquire greater significance, maybe more um, 
uh, impact from their recommendations, uh, but the, the SDGs have been covered in Parliament extensively. Uh, I'll link to some of these uh, committee reports at the end. So there is kind of an ongoing review process, and there are plans in the wind, I understand, for something a bit more joined up, some kind of process of regular UK-wide domestic <laughs> review with Parliament as the focus. Uh, it's worth noting that uh, devolved administrations in Wales and Scotland have their own approaches, and there's a, a question I'm not going to go into today for reasons of speed. I'm happy to touch on it in discussion um, about uh, how all this fits together, both in terms of the, the data architecture and the reporting, the policy, and also the review processes. Um, so Bruce Howard asked a question here. Uh, we can discuss this in more detail in the uh, the follow-up, but uh, the short answer is uh, I can see they probably will. Uh, you know, they will confuse um, implementation. Now, this isn't... So the thing about the SDGs is, so one way in which they're not a slam dunk is that they allow for differentiation at national levels. They allow for countries and, you know, uh, regions to prioritize uh, aspects of the agenda that they think are most important. So I'm sure it's going to confuse implementation of the SDGs, but it's not the case that that's necessarily, I mean, it's a confusion, I guess it's, it's almost always a bad thing, but at the same time, it's exactly what you would expect. You expect countries to um, to a certain extent, kind of prioritize and, and slightly uh, reorder these goals and choose their own policy responses to them. So it's not necessarily an improper confusion. I think the SDGs prompt the debate about what to do first and what your country thinks is most important. And if, if the, uh, the different priorities of, of the devolved administrations reflect those discussions, then uh, that's not necessarily a problem. Uh, maybe it's exactly what we want. Um, but we can talk about this more uh, later, if that's okay, Bruce. So, uh, just to give you an update on the, 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 the global and the regional dimensions to the, the structures. Um, so the UN uh, instated a capstone body called the High Level Political Forum, which meets annually uh, to discuss some of these things globally, discuss global progress. It also offers a rolling program of national reviews. Um, so countries, there's no set um, interval at which countries have to report. The reports themselves aren't... I think they're still a work in progress in terms of how critical and how much accountability they allow for and how much transparency they promote. Um, but there's, they are a work in progress and, and um, there is a rolling review mechanism. Uh, and I understand uh, the Republic of Ireland is due to report in 2018. It may even be that the UK reports in 2018, but there certainly is pressure for the UK to report. Um, there's a UN process going on on indicators and what gets measured, and they have their own timetable set out for next steps and review. There are UN forums set up on science, technology, and innovation, uh, including digital democracy, I take it, um, also on partnerships, uh, such as the Open Government Partnership. Um, it's, it's a set of kind of invigorated business engagement institutions. Uh, the UN Global Compact, I think, has got a, a, a kind of a second or third wind out of this. Um, there's also some... Uh, uh, so it's not just the devolved administrations of, of the uh, different national entities in the UK that, that's significant here, but also the uh, responses of cities and local authorities. And there are also forums going on at the global level for those kinds of um, uh, actors to, to engage. Um, and cities certainly have been quite active and got quite a good head of steam. So I think it's also worth asking what, uh, say, Belfast might do as, as part of those networks. At the regional level, uh, not this might matter to us for much longer. There's a European Union level architecture which is under construction, but there are also non-EU level European architectures. So, for example, uh, the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe uh, has a, a, an annual regional forum for sustainable development. Um, I went this year. I didn't think it was brilliant. Again, that's work in progress. We'll see how that develops. Um, I think generally with the SDGs being in the early days, uh, much of this is still up for grabs in terms of what it develops into and how effectively it promotes um, some of the values that, that open government uh, rests on. Okay, so um, lastly, before we discuss some of this, uh, on to participation. So I wanted to say something about, uh, say, open government values in particular. Uh, but I didn't want to do, because I think it was done very well by uh, is it Craig last time around in, this, in the webinar, um, just to, to uh, kind of run through goal 16. Um, so there is 
so goal 16 is the obvious home for open government values in the SDGs but it's not the only one uh, so you do find commitments to uh, participation in the context of town planning or in, in context of how water supplies are managed and these sorts of things um, you find so you find these kinds of values elsewhere not just in goal 16 um, so in goal 16 and beyond Participation, open government is a means of implementation, a way of achieving these. It's recognised that it's important to achieving them. Um, what maybe is worth bringing people's attention to is that there's a, a guiding principle in the SDG review framework. So the, the way in which everybody at every level has to review uh, the SDGs, I kind of monitor the SDGs. There's a principle that should be done in a participatory, inclusive, transparent way. And there are lots of other open government and human rights uh, uh, kinds of principles in there too. I think that's quite interesting. I think that potentially is quite useful. Uh, so if a review is going on anywhere that you know doesn't do that, then again you have the resource to ask uh, why given this commitment. Uh, and that's a reason to think that the direction of travel might be towards more more participatory, more inclusive um, reviews. It's also a commitment of the, the forms and structures around the SDG. So the, the high level political forum in New York has, so I've used some jargon here, I say participatory modalities, I and mean, modalities is, is the word that, that they will use. Um, it just means that civil society groups, uh, individuals, different stakeholders are allowed to um, submit things in writing, they're allowed to uh, speak, and they may well get a chance to speak in the, uh, in the open sessions. Um, they're allowed to organize events alongside it, they're allowed to attend, participate, talk to people in the margins, um, and that's positive. Um, and that also cascades down to the, the regional forum, and as I'll say in a second, maybe also to some of the UK things. Um, this focus in the SDGs on leaving no one behind um, also means there's a commitment to hearing from the most disadvantaged and marginalized, um, and that might be an especially kind of powerful way of, of uh, uh, leveraging some open government values here. The UK structures have uh, a kind of an open and a participatory component to them as well. So um, the ONS is launching a consultation on, on this and they're happy to discuss it and I think they're hoping to get out and talk with groups and with individuals about this. Um, you know, in, uh, so uh, I spoke to the head of team at ONS and she's hoping to do this in quite a so I know participation means a lot of things to a lot of people in a kind of participatory sort of way. And so she's hoping to get out and meet with groups and take their input. Um, parliamentary committees, I think the uh, Environmental Audit Committee was an example of this, um, have, have reached out beyond Parliament. So they went to, I think, to Birmingham and had an event where they heard from young people and uh, local stakeholders and this kind of thing. And I'd expect that trend to continue. Um, participation, I understand, is kind of big business in Scotland um, and in, in Wales is kind of part of the, the way that uh, though their sustainable development commitments, not just the, their response to the SDGs, have been rolled out. Um, so to summarise this section, uh, and I'll summarise the whole thing, um, the SDGs certainly promote participation in open government. They put value on it, they encourage it, they provide some language that, you know, might prove helpful in promoting it. Uh, they provide some new forms for it to develop. Um, but I guess this comes out of what I said about the national priorities question. They also need participation in open government because the SDGs don't generate um, policies by themselves. At least not in my, I mean, people will say they, they will. In my view, that's, uh, uh, that's well, you, can, you can make that move, but I think it's, it should be made cautiously. Um, so even what should be measured, let alone what should be done, you know, requires deliberation and debate. Um, and it also requires public awareness as a way of moving that forward. Um, so the relationship goes both ways. Um, okay, so in summary, that's um, the UK picture, which says that the, the goals are pretty relevant to the UK domestically, even in the social dimension, quite apart from the environmental one. Um, that's the UK process, which would mean the UK is engaging with the goals domestically, Parliament's engaging with the goals, the, uh, devolved administration, local actors are engaging with the goals. Um, I think if there's one group that maybe isn't engaging with the goals as much as it might, it's UK domestic organized civil society. Uh, so groups within the UK who engage on social issues, I think are, uh, well, I guess they, I think it'd be worth kind of trying to reach out for them, reach out to them more and, and, and see what the, uh, see what, how the SDGs and the, the, the new forms and spaces might be relevant to them. Uh, and then lastly, some kind of reflection on the place of uh, open government participation in the goals. Uh, okay, so I'll shut up and take uh, whatever questions or we can have a discussion of this. Thanks so much.
Thank you, Graham. Uh, some fascinating insights there. A uh, really comprehensive overview. Um, I wonder should if Bruce is still there. Um, could we maybe go back to his question? Or Bruce, do you want to come in there? Bruce, no? Okay, maybe uh, Bruce has left. Um, maybe we can come back to that question. I suppose just um, one question I have is just around the devolved regions and to what extent each of the devolved regions, uh, do you have any insights into, sorry, to what extent each of the devolved regions are progressing work around the SDGs, uh, particularly in Wales and Scotland? So I know work is progressing. Um, I think probably it's it's uneven. So I know in the, um, so I should say this isn't in my area of expertise, I think it's something that needs looking at, um, but there's so much to look at. Um, in uh, Scotland, I know they've aligned the National uh, Action Plan and the indicators for that to the SDGs. I think a lot of discussions going on around uh, uh, compatibility, I think they've made more noise about the SDGs as a, as a parliament, as a, um, uh, uh, a government. Um, I think the same is also true in Wales. In Wales, famously, there's this kind of legal framework, this idea of uh, is that a ministry now, so a commission for future generations and, and this kind of test of how things will affect, affect future generations. Um, I think the, for me, the, the, so I think progress has been uneven, even though people seem to be leaping ahead with this, because there are limits to what the, um, what these devolved administrations can do. I mean, they're, they're devolved and they can't do more than their competencies. You know, so that's what they're, 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 they have the authority to do and also, you know, the, the power that they have. Um, and I think it would be very interesting to map the SDGs as a whole onto the competencies. Now, it's very easy for a government of a devolved administration to claim they're putting the SDGs at the heart of everything they do. I don't know, I just don't know yet how far that claim would survive, close scrutiny of what they can do uh, versus the kinds of things that the SDGs ask for. So I think obviously, I know sustainable development is a devolved competence, but I think one thing that's interesting about the SDGs is that they go wider than the traditional sustainable development um, uh, set of issues. And so I think that kind of, uh, that slight mismatch, I think needs some study. Sure. Um, is that any help? Yeah, absolutely. And just uh, another question linked to that. Um, do you feel that the devolved nations, uh, if you like, have an obligation to report, say, for example, to Whitehall on an implementation plan, or is it very much a voluntary commitment? Um, what are your thoughts around that? Um, so I, I suspect they probably at some point have an obligation to uh, be part of whatever UK level monitoring effort goes on. Um, but I mean, to say that they have an obligation isn't to say that somehow it's going to have to be dragged out of people. I think it, instead it's the case, so my understanding from ONS, for example, that they're, they're working in partnership with um, the, the people doing the, the indicator work in, in Scotland and Wales. Uh, and and no doubt in Northern Ireland as well. Um, so I think they would characterise the relationship as one of, parliament, of, of kind of partnership rather than anyone being kind of obliged to do anything. I think when it comes to reporting to the UN, uh, I think the formal situation is probably that you know they ought to um, uh, that they they. Well, I think things are going to go bad if they don't hand their data over, and also if they don't um, kind of tell Whitehall what they're what they're up to. But I think there's no sense that that's you know that's that's not happening. Uh, but I, think, I suspect there probably is an obligation at some point along the line, but I don't think we've reached that stage. Okay. Uh, I'll maybe just put it out to the floor and see if there are any other questions uh, coming along. I have plenty more questions for you, Graham, but um, I'll just leave it for a minute and see if any other questions are coming in. I noticed uh, Bruce has, has put another one in, in chat. Oh, I also okay. noticed that is, is, uh, is Alex, Alex is unmuted. I don't know if you want to take... Um, who you want me to respond to first? Does, does I can see Alex on the list of attendees. Does Alex have a question? I oh, know, and they're now muted. Scared them off. Um, I take Bruce's question in chat. So Bruce asks in chat: Are there any lessons from the Millennium Development Goals in terms of participation, UK application, definition, or metrics? Um, I think that's an interesting question. Um, uh, sorry, that's that's it's obvious. It's an interesting question. Um, I think what's so one thing which, in one way in which the SDGs are very different is that the SDGs explicitly apply to the UK at home, whereas the MDGs didn't. And that's true for developed countries generally. I think that's required a bit of a shift in mindset. I think obviously some aspects of this, 
um, the domestic actors in the UK were very familiar with. So the environmental sustainability agenda, climate change, um, uh, the overseas development component um, were very kind of were home territory. So I think the goals have found their their feet in the UK in that home territory and also across Europe. So if you look across uh, European countries, the lead agency in the early stages in government has always been, in my experience, either the well, okay, maybe with the ex maybe with the exception of the Finns and the Germans, but. Um, so I'm in a, uh, a European level uh, network of government actors and everybody who goes along to the conference is either in the environmental departments or the overseas aid, the foreign ministries. Um, and I think that's because this is, this is how uh, people were expecting it to go. The MDGs are just different from the, S uh, from the SDGs in this respect. They don't generate a domestic agenda for developed countries in quite the same way. So we are in some uncharted territory here, I think, in some ways. Um, so I think in terms of UK participation, there's not a it's not a clear precedent from the, from the MDGs. Obviously, people did participate in in pushing for the UK government to do more about the MDGs, but the, but not necessarily in a domestic context. Um, I think again, in terms of uh, so, you would think the lesson from the MDGs would be that well, we need um, uh, uh, realistic, uh, clearly defined goals uh, that then are well measured, and that's how you achieve progress. Um, but I think it's clear that the, the SDGs haven't taken exactly that route. They're just a more complex, uh, interlinked set of priorities for everyone at lots of different levels. Uh, so they've gone big and wide in a way that the MDGs didn't. Um, and I don't know whether that's so. So if you're going to draw a lesson from the MDGs and you think the MDGs work, then you would say you wanted more of the same, and that's not what we've got. I think a different lesson to learn from the MDGs is that, well, these weren't very participatory. Uh, and that's a lesson certainly that has been learned. So these goals are, are kind of trumpeted as being much more participatory in terms of how they were developed and how they're going to be implemented. The idea is to involve more people. Um, I guess you can ask how far that's lip service and how far that's, that's genuine. Um, so I think they're less well-defined than the, the MDGs. I think the metrics are less clear than the MDGs. I think the participation lesson certainly been learned. The UK application lesson, um, well, if the lesson uh, would be that uh, there's work to do at home as well as overseas. I think that lesson's been learnt, and that's that's where the SDGs acquire some power in the UK context. Um, so I don't know whether that helps at all, Bruce, but hopefully that speaks to some of the, your questions. Uh, so Graham Smith yeah. asks. I'm oh, sorry. Kind of. Do you want to? No, that's fine. Yeah, I think uh, Graham Smith's question actually any examples of interesting participatory approaches to definition or implementation of the SDGs from outside the UK? Um, so uh, I don't have detailed examples, but there are some out there. I just don't have any to hand. Uh, I think it's widely thought that uh, Germany, uh, Finland, um, Colombia, uh, are amongst the, the leaders in this kind of approach to the SDGs and also maybe Mexico. So Colombia and Mexico will, will kind of trumpet how far they've involved people um, uh, at local levels and, and built up from that and how they kind of have these participatory uh, committee and commission structures that um, allow people to have a say. Um, I think other countries have, have made some efforts to try and bring in, so I mentioned leave no one behind before and I think obviously one response to that is to try and identify some of the people who have been traditionally left behind and make sure they're included in the conversation. And I do think a number of countries are doing that. Uh, I think uh, uh, disabled people are one group in particular. Um, so, I mean, I'm, so I'm using the wrong terminology. I don't know, you know these, are, these are individuals, not, it's maybe in one sense kind of unfair to call them a group. Uh, but, but social and economic groupings is kind of a phrase that gets thrown around. And I think um, marginalized or vulnerable social and economic groupings have had I think there are some, some special efforts, like UNDP is helping with this in different country contexts to try and include those people in the discussions. Um, so I think there are some general examples of kind of uh, open government approaches to this. Um, so, um, and then there are some quite specific ways in which different countries have, have brought in uh, people and kind of grassroots participation efforts. Um, so there's there's... So when it comes to definition, I think the definition question is about uh, country-level priorities. Uh, of course, the UN, the uh, SDGs themselves were kind of based, or well, they, they invoked an effort of this kind. The, the My World survey, which people might have seen, was an effort to uh, ask lots of people across the world 
uh, this kind of question about which of these 16 uh, areas should would you consider priorities? Um, and I guess that's a kind of an, uh, uh, a question on, on definition. Um, so I don't, I don't know whether that, any of that helps uh, Graham Smith, but that said, there are a range of, of uh, approaches. I think Germany's approach to governance of the SDGs is very interesting. I think Finland will trumpet the work they've done involving NGOs um, in the discussion uh, and people in the discussion in Finland. So I think there's an online platform, there's kind of a, an open consultation. I think Sweden also does something similar. Um, but then you hear from some NGOs in these places that they, they don't find that uh, these processes are as well managed as they could be or they are quite as in inclusive as they could be. Um, so it's a, a mixed picture, but I think there is some good practice elsewhere. Um, okay, I've got, shall I go to uh, yeah, there's, uh, uh, Lucy Goodman? Yeah, go to Lucy, yeah. <clears throat> uh, so uh, Lucy, on the... Uh, environmental targets uh, I don't think the so I mean from so I should say I'm a, I'm a generalist here not a specialist um, and so you'll have more of a sense maybe of the detail of the the targets and the say goals 14 and 15 than I do um, so I think there's, there's it's so it's my understanding that we have plenty of environmental indicators for the UK already and the question is how commensable they are to the the SDG indicator and this is a bit of a, a minefield I mean so the, the GNCC has a kind of a uh, you know so what my colleagues in biology tell me is kind of a, a relatively good set of indicators that, that they're developing um, you know and the UK has had some sustainable development indicators um, so I don't get a sense that there's so in terms of a straightforward information gap of something that we're not measuring I don't get a sense that's too bad and um, what I think there is well I think there is a big a body of work to be done is is to just solve this question of commensurability I mean, and in a way that's a that's a question about what to do about that so does it matter that uh, in the UK we we measure some of the environmental goals and targets in a slightly different way on slightly different terms over slightly different time scales to the ones that the the, the UN is wanting uh, and do you adapt your processes to do what the UN wants or do you uh, stick with your processes and um, let the UN try and extrapolate from that. Um, so I think there's quite a, there's a question here about what to do, quite apart from the um, uh, kind of this assessment of how big that gap in commensurability is. So the commensurability question is how easy these indicators are to compare. Um, I mean, there is, so I think if there's a, a, a potent information gap, I, or, but it's more than information gap is on fossil fuel subsidies and what constitutes a subsidy. So the, there's a, a clear target on eliminating fossil fuel subsidies. As people who are familiar with this might know, the UK, the UK government um, denies that what it does for the fossil fuel industry amounts to subsidy on, a, uh, on the right definition. And I think <laughs> fixing that definition might be quite an important issue, uh, but that's you know, more than just informational. Um, I think when you get to the the, the nitty gritty of so of uh, disaggregation, I think that's another big gap. Um, so I get the sense some of the scientific like inverted commas indicators for environmental targets in the UK might be disaggregated better. So by ocean area or which part of the coastline or um, which region or which uh, uh, area of, of scientific interest you're talking about or which national park, but. Um, so I guess that's, that's not too bad, but I suspect there are still some problems here with, with trying to, to dig down into details of different species or ecosystems and how they're faring and these kinds of things. But like I said, I'm there are some indicators from the JNCC and DEFRA that are under development. I don't think that's too bad. Maybe sustainable farming is an area where there's some need for stronger indicators. Um, that, so I'm just trying to think back over all the different uh, targets. I'm, I'm happy to correspond with, with Lucy more about that if you want. Uh, I can give you a few more details if I uh, bring out the information, but that would probably slow us down a bit. I hope that's helpful. Yeah, uh, thanks Graham. Um, just I suppose one, unless Lucy wants to come in, um, I have one very general question just about, I suppose from an overarching perspective, are the SDGs do you think going to add any value in terms of delivering real change or is it used as a mechanism to make ourselves feel good and to map what is already being done uh, from a policy perspective in the UK, or is it going to add something new to what is currently being done? Uh, so um, I think it certainly it certainly could add something new politically, 
Um, so obviously, you know, we you know we look around at the moment, and you see how a kind of a discourse of, of equality, or at least the problem of inequality, is is very potent. Um, I think the discourse of people not wanting to be ignored or wanting to feel their participation is valued is also kind of quite potent. I think the SDGs um, present a different way of a, a kind of a different route to some of those same conclusions or reinforce some of those same conclusions. Um, so what I, I think more generally what I was saying about uh, kind of the SDGs as a tool for accountability is I think they, 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 they certainly could be useful in prompting this question. I think uh, it's, it's striking to see I think in other countries that they, these are being used very directly and very politically um, and I think they were I mean I think the reason why we have a, a UK government response on the SDGs domestically is because the SDGs were used politically here uh, so the head of the environmental audit uh, committee amongst others there was a Westminster Hall debate and she uh, just threw, th threw some stats about uh, UK implementation at, at DFID and uh, I, I, my personal view, I don't know for certain, I've no way of knowing, is, is that that has prompted some of the government action. It's clearly a kind of a political dimension, but it's a clearly a way in which it can reinforce some change. Um, just the presence of other uh, actors and processes outside the UK can also bring some, some pressure to bear or kind of, uh, or equally some kind of best practice to, to build on. Um, so I, I, I'm cautiously optimistic about the I think certainly the SDGs could bring about real change I mean, you don't have to structure your whole system of government or um, your national planning around the SDGs I think you just have to spot the overlaps and then ask the question of whether the SDGs offer anything or, or where the SDGs might offer something new um, I can give you some more specific context so I'm doing some work in Sierra Leone at the moment and I think um, if you look at it's interesting for me to compare what Sierra Leone has in and out of its national indicator set. I think there's some interest. I think just using the SDGs as a point of comparison prompts some interesting questions. So why aren't you measuring um, currently? You know how much of your your government budget goes on uh, poverty alleviation, like the SDGs say that you might, or um, why aren't you? Uh, do you really think it's not worth measuring social protection flaws yet because you're not at that? Uh, uh, level across your country or is, is that something that's worth bearing in mind I think it always prompts some quite interesting questions um, so it just doesn't generate straightforward action partly because it needs this mapping work and this reflection on priorities and relevance to go on okay thanks Graham um, I think there's another question from Graham Smith or is a comment on yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, so participation I think is is uh, so the question of how you measure participation or the right kind of participation in in these processes is is I think a tricky one, and that's why partly why the indicators are underdeveloped. And also, participation globally is a tricky question. So there was a um, I mean there was resistance to to goal 16 being in the goals. There was resistance to um, popular participation and the, the the rights and the enabling environment that can support that participation being in the goals. Uh, and so the result of that is that there's 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 leeway. I think that leeway has partly presented itself in the indicators, but also participation is quite a, a you know, is in some ways a less straightforward thing to measure um, than than some of the other things. Uh, so I think you're 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 right that we're further away from decent indicators there, Graham Smith. Um, now I guess the the further you get away from uh, I don't know natural science or whatever, it might be the case that just um, these the the indicators themselves being you know bang on isn't as important as the kind of, of sentiment or or spirit or how you can use some of the SDGs to push for things. Um, and here I think you know what people can do with the demands for participation can get quite political and doesn't have to rely on there being a really high quality indicator. So I think certainly the indicators for goal 16 can be improved. There's actually a, a participatory project on improving those. Um, I think there's a, there are some countries signed up to that as well. I think the OGP might be involved in that. So I think they can improve and that's, there is a process for indicators to improve over time and that's built into them. I think if we use that process well, there's no reason why they can't get better. But it's not just about how good the indicators are, but how but kind of what you what you do with them and how you use the the, the targets and the values. I think that's probably more true on the uh, the kind of the, the governance um, uh, value side of this. Uh, Alex asks, will MSPs have a debate about the SDGs? So I think the answer is yes, but I'm not. Uh, but I couldn't tell you when or where. It's just something I think I kind of. Uh, caught in the wind. Um, so my understanding is that they probably will, although there's there's a, a lot going on. Uh, so certainly uh, Westminster has had a debate about the uh, the SDGs. 
Uh, it's, it has debates, parliamentary questions. There's an all-party parliamentary group on them. Um, so I'd have thought if there hasn't been one, there will be one. Yeah, it's online from Scotland who's been involved in any way in the, the SDGs in Scotland. I don't think I see any, any names I recognise, but uh, certainly I know that the, the Scottish government seem uh, quite favourable towards the idea um, and are being quite active around the SDGs, but certainly in, in, the, in comparison to Northern Ireland where things are a little bit of standstill currently. Um, just finally from, from me, Graham, are there any, um, in terms of an English context, has there been any significant stakeholder participation undertaken by government, any roadshows, workshops, events, things like that to, to invite input, or maybe they're using existing channels to try and do that? Um, so I don't, think, I don't think government has done that well. Uh, I think, I mean, uh, there are roadshows. I know the Open University has been around the UK doing roadshows. I think they ran one in Northern Ireland. Uh, maybe some people who went to it. Um, I know that the UK Global Compact have been going around the UK doing roadshows. So I know the Environmental Audit Committee did one. I think they're, they're maybe planning to do more as, as, as part of future uh, plans. Um, so I'm not aware of the government doing many roadshows. I mean, certainly a key recommendation of the EAC report is that the government could do more to promote um, dissipation. I think the government has to be kind of dragged a bit on this. Um, so there aren't lots of government roadshows, but there are plenty of roadshows. And if you want a roadshow, I can <laughs> probably get you one. Uh, but it, I think not from central government. Um, but this is an interesting question about whether they should, so whether if, if if the style of government in the UK became more participatory, that kind of thing would be, I take it, part of the norm. I mean, it takes more than that, but that would be a part of it. Uh, and that's also a way in which you promote that kind of slight shift in, uh, towards a, a UK in which uh, people feel day-to-day -day slightly more listened to. I think that, I don't know, again, there's kind of a, a sense of that, that kind of you know, post-Brexit, um, there's a kind of a, a sense that, that uh, somebody's thinking about that somewhere. Um, I don't know quite what form that might take, uh, but I think it's worth you know pushing for. And it's certainly something uh, from a, in a Northern Irish context. We'll be looking to try and engage with government again as soon as the institutions are back up and running. Uh, once we have a, a few uh, political masters uh, back in charge, we can start to try and endorse and push for the SDGs and push for some um, greater action within government. Yeah. Is there any, um, I'm not sure if there are any final questions, anybody would like to raise anything uh, before we, we close? Uh, Graham, do you have any final comments or anything? Well, i just say uh, thanks to everyone for listening. I put my email on the, uh, the first slide. If anyone's got any further questions or comments or wants to uh, chat further about any of this, please do get in touch and I'll try and help out. Great. Uh, well, from me, just a big thank you to Graham for taking the time. Uh, uh, to address us this morning. I think there's been some fantastic insights and a great overview and you've, you've managed uh, the bombardment of questions very well. Um, we're hoping probably to have our next webinar towards the end of August, early September. We haven't confirmed a date. Uh, if you'd like to join our network, you can do that. Uh, there'll be a link sent out to the Open Government Forum uh, via email. Uh, the audio of today's webinar will be posted on the UK Open Government website um, as well as the forum where this discussion can be continued. Uh, so just a final thank you to everyone for tuning in, uh, and I hope you'll be able to join us at our next webinar. Thanks. Great, thank you. Thank you.